Good evening. In the old days, I always started by telling a joke. Uh, I've long since stopped doing that because people need time to get used to my sing-song. I speak the most beautiful Norwegian English that any person on the surface of the earth speaks. And it takes time, particularly for the interpreters, to get used to this. Consequently, I have to tell a number of unimportant things initially. I will tell, first of all, that I am delighted to be back in Geneva. Uh, I lived, luckily, in Comigny for six years uh, in the 1990s, and I've been out snowshoeing in the uh, Jura this morning in the lovely surroundings, which I know very well. So that's unimportant point number one. <laughs> unimportant point number two is that I'm going to show a large number of slides. These slides you don't need to look at. <laughs> the slides are there only to impress you. <laughs> they are there in order to tell you that there is very much more work, thinking, and reality behind what I'm saying than the very simple words that I am using in order to hope that you understand my message. For those of you who like slides, Please have a look, but for those of you who don't like slides, listen to what I say. I say everything that you need to take with you. So, apparently you know, understand. Uh, I am I'm a depressed man. I'm old and I have a smiling face. And the reason for this is that I have spent the last 40 years working for sustainable development in the various positions mentioned by Daniel. And I have failed in the sense that the world is less sustainable today than it was in 1970 when I started my hard work. And that makes me depressed. It is most obvious uh, that we are in unsustainable territory when we look at the climate situation. Humanity emits every year twice as much CO2 into the atmosphere as is being absorbed by the oceans and the forests of the world. The remaining one half ends in the atmosphere and stays there for hundreds of years. And as the, we keep pumping the CO2, the concentration in the atmosphere rises systematically and will continue to rise, and along with it, the temperature, until we stop pumping the CO2 into the atmosphere. So we will have to stop pumping if we want the temperature to stop rising. This is what unsustainability are is all about, and we are in unsustainable territory. We were not in unsustainable territory when I started my work in 1970. So that's why I am depressed. I keep smiling because I communicate better if I smile. Let me go back uh, 30, uh, 40 years. Uh, the limits to growth, which appeared, as Daniel said, in 1972, is a small book that contains 12 pictures of the future, 12 scenarios for world development from 1970 to the year 2100. Six of those stories were sad stories, where something went wrong in the 21st century, either because resources ran out or because there were too many people or too little food or whatever. And six of the scenarios were more or less positive scenarios where humanity in you know, partly or fully managed to get in place a society where the well level of well-being was fairly high throughout. What was later, you know, got the name sustainable development or sustainability. The important thing about the 1972 book was that in 1972 we did not know enough to be able to tell which of those 12 scenarios was the most likely one. So all we could do was, and, and this was due to lack of data and lack of knowledge of global systems at the time. All we could do was to draw very general conclusions, 
of the type that the planet is small, the world is much smaller than most people thought in 1972, that overshoot of global limits are likely, or is likely within the 21st century if one did not change one's ways. And that finally, if humanity was stupid enough to allow its total ecological footprint and population to exceed the sustainable carrying capacity of the planet, there would be only one way out, namely down. Either through a managed decline of human activity or through collapse induced by markets or by nature. So that was the simple uh, message of uh, the limits to growth. Now 40 years have passed and we have learned a lot. We know very much more today than we did uh, 40 years ago. In fact, in my mind, we know so much today that we are able to tell what will happen over the next 40 years. We no longer need to make scenarios that this could happen or that could happen or this could happen or that could happen. We know enough to, sell, to tell that this is what will happen. And the reason why we are able to make a forecast, which is totally different from making a scenario analysis, is that we know what kind of decision systems are going to be used during this period. Humanity, due to the short-term nature of human beings, prefer democracy and capitalism as the two major systems of governance. These systems are so beloved by you and rest of humanity that they are unlikely to be significantly changed over the next 30 years. Consequently, it is fully possible to describe what kind of future these decision systems are going to, decide, to, to create for themselves. And this is what I have done in the 2052 uh, uh, book. I basically told you and global society what kind of future you are going to create because you are going to continue to operate in a short-term nature uh, uh, way at the individual, at the corporate, at the national, at the regional and the global level. And it is very simple you know, to look at what will be the sum total of those decisions. Of course, you know, technologies will continue to evolve and many things will change, but these are rather simple to, to, to overview. Look, and this is what is in the 2052 book. This is a report to the Club of Rome, like the 1972 book was. Uh, and uh, it is now out in six languages uh, and the important thing is what is in the white box. On the web, at a site called www.2052.info, you can find absolutely all the math, the numbers, the 50,000 historical figures, you know, the articles, papers, everything is there. And you can even, if you go in, make your own forecast. It is set up so that you can put in your assumptions and see what kind of future comes out. I advise strongly against this. This is a waste of your time because my forecast is, of course, much better than anything that you will ever get close to. I have spent 40 years on this. You will spend at most four hours. Mine is between 100 and 1,000 times better than yours. <laughs> Making the forecast, I split the world first in five regions. The US, China, the rest of the industrial world, the 14 largest emerging economies and the rest of the world, the 140 largely small and largely poor nations of the world. I made a forecast for each of those five regions at the regional level and I add them up and that is the global forecast. And since I've only been given five hours of talking time, I will only go through the global forecast you know, we can take an equal time on each of the regions or further down if you want to, but you don't want to. So I will give you the global forecast as quickly as I can so we get to the more interesting discussion of what this actually means. The simplest uh, element, and uh, if you want to start this, is to start with the world population. 
So there were uh, my graphs, for those of you who look at the graphs, have history from 1970 to 2010. These are historical data from UN, World Bank, uh, uh, the International Energy Association, etc. And the right-hand part, the next 40 years, is my forecast. And if you have the mental capacity to look at many curves at the same time, look at all three. If your mental capacity is limited, you look at the red. You know, that it's always the red curve which is the most important. You see, one of my tricks is that I try to be as arrogant as I really am. And the, and the hope is that someone finally gets so irritated that they go out and modify capitalism and democracy in such a way that you will end up making the correct decisions sometime during the next 40 years. And I know from great experience that it takes an enormous amount of arrogancy you know, in order to kick people into action like this. It is my desperate hope that I will succeed one day. The global population will peak in 2040 and will be in decline in uh, 2050. The reason why the world population will not go the way you think it will, with 10 billion people uh, around 2050, is that the women of the world will choose to have very much fewer children than you think, and the UN medium uh, forecast thinks. The rich women, the women in the rich world will continue to choose a career rather than having more children, and importantly, the women in the poor world largely live in horrible urban slums where the cost of having children is so high that fertility rates are dropping like a stone. As a consequence, there will not, we, will, we will touch 8 billion people 30 years into the future and the world population will be declining you know, when we pass 2052. So there will be a much smaller population than you think. Uh, the reason why you think I'm wrong is that you are unduly influenced by the UN medium population forecast, which says that there will be 10 billion people in 2050 before it starts declining. My forecast is very similar to the UN low forecast, which most journalists don't seem to believe exists, since they never talk about it. The second important part is to talk about the world economy. You know, what is going to happen over the next 40 years with the world GDP? So the GDP is nothing except a measure of the annual production of goods and services at market prices. So it is how much we do, it's an activity measure. Uh, since I started talking about these things, the world economy has grown by a factor of four. So there are four times more factories and ships and cars and buildings now than when I was a young man talking about these things. This is the red line. It has grown at an average of 3.5% per year since 1970. If the world were to come back, which it will not, to traditional growth rates and continued to grow at 3.5% a year over the next 40 years, the world economy in 2050 would have been four times as big as it is today. It will not. It will only be roughly twice as big as it is today, as given by the red line. Why is this? Well, you should think about the world economy as the product of two things. It's the number of hands, you know, the people, it's the workforce, multiply with the production of each of those hands in a year. So it's the productivity. And you know, of course, from my first slide that the workforce of the world is going to reach a peak around 2040 and be in decline after 2040. So the question is, what will happen to productivity growth, you know, in the future? And my main message here is that in the rich world, which is the highest productivity, Productivity growth is going to continue its long downward trend so that we very quickly, within this decade, will reach 0% per year in productivity uh, growth. Why? Uh, and, and as a consequence, you know, the GDP of the Western world is going to stay more or less constant you know, uh, on a per capita basis. Uh, and when the, the population starts to decline, the GDP is also going to start declining. What is the underlying 
understandable explanation of this. It is that the rich world has already done this simple productivity increase. So we started with most of the people working in agriculture. Then we added you know, tractors and, and pesticides and diesel, and we you know, made it possible for a small number of people to produce more than enough food for the rest of us. So we moved people into manufacturing. Then we added more capital, more technology, so we could liberalize the people and move them into services, simple office work. Then we add computers and we move the people into entertainment, talks, uh, education, you know, things like this. And we move them into real services and then we computerize the offices and then we can move people into where people will all end, which is basically the nursing homes and the health sector. So, and increasing productivity in this part, the physical production, and in the simple office work where you can computerize very easily. That's a piece of cake compared to doing what the Americans are now trying to do, and Norwegians and others thinking rich countries, you know, which is to increase fundamental productivity among the women that are going to watch me in the nursing home in another three years when I'm, you know, really done. Uh, and so this is, this is what is going on. And when you look at the statistics of productivity growth over the last 50 years, you see the fa fabulous, inexorable, easily understandable trend from high productivity growth in per capita CO2, uh, GDP in 1950, to close to zero now. So that's what's going on. And so in America, you know, they have 17% of the workforce in health, trying to keep the other Americans slim. And when you see the result, you understand that you need more than 17% of the labor force in health. 2% of the American labor force feeds the rest of the population. So you're already in a situation where food is cheap, things will move very quickly into the same category, that every, every product is cheap, it's made by a robot, Energy is going to be cheap, because once you have the sun and the wind in, the marginal cost of production is very close. And we will have the whole labor force out here in the soggy, foggy, sad, horrible type of activity, which it is to tend to elderly gentlemen before they die. That's the productivity challenge of the future. It is not what the old-fashioned manufacturing industry associations and others are talking about. It's not here. It is there. And this is not going to work. And as a consequence, the world economy is only going to be twice as big in 2050 as it is today. Of course, the poor world, this was the development in the mature economies. Clearly, a number of poor countries are going to be able to copy the great model of the authoritarian regimes, Japan, South Korea, and now China, which is catching up you know, very quickly, you know, copying the slow rise uh, of productivity in the rest, the Western world. These things are coming from behind. And so the, the reason why the curve at all grows is, of course, because we will get tremendous growth in, you know, China and, and, and no, a handful of other uh, big emerging economies. The poor, as you will see, will remain poor. And then there is a third point, uh, which I would hope that you can manage to remember. So I've told you about the population, I've told you about the world economy, and I'm now going to tell you about the fact that we will have to use a large number of people and a large amount of capital to solve those problems that everyone know are there, the pollution, the depletion, the inequity, the climate damage, all of these things that we pretend are not there and are just postponing as long as possible. Over the next 40 years, the Dutch will have to start building higher dikes. The Americans are already building the dam around Manhattan so that next time the sea level rises, it doesn't flood the subway etc. Et Norwegians are trying now to put the wonderful roads that go along the fjord with the steep hills coming down because the tundra is melting uphill. You know, we get landslides all the time, which makes it impossible to run the roads. So we're drilling the roads into the, the mountain, just like you're doing with your overhangs up in the Alps. These things cost money. 
uh, and more importantly, it means that we will have to use labor, ordinary women, you know, and men, you know, to do this work with machines. And that is increasing the investment share of the economy. It's actually reducing the amount of consumption growth because those people that will have to drill those tunnels or big the dikes cannot produce the suits or the ladies underwear or the toys that is you know the ultimate goal of capitalist society namely consumer goods so this is going to happen and my estimate is that whereas in the past it has been sufficient to take 25% of the total annual production uh, for investment purposes, you know, to build future society, we will have to increase this by roughly another 50% by 2050. As a consequence, global, global consumption is going to stagnate. And it's not going to stagnate because the Swiss Ecological Association finally gets its values permeating into society. You know, people will stop consuming because there are limitations on the productive capacity. We, you know, people will have to repair damage rather than, than producing new consumer goods to some extent. And that's what uh, will happen. So you have now the three elements that you should try to remember. Population developments, economic development, and the fact that we will get forced to handle all those problems that we are simply basically postponing at this point in time. I will now be much quicker uh, on the other issues. Once I know uh, what the world economy is going to look like, it's very quick to calculate how much energy we will need. Because we know how energy efficiency has increased over the last 30 years. There is all reason to believe that this will continue. And as a consequence, energy use will reach a peak in 2040 and will be in decline uh, thereafter. This is all energy. This is not only uh, electricity. And you can, you know, if you care to read some of the 400 pages of the book, you know, you can then see further detail. This is the detail in what kind of energy sources we're going to use. Uh, basically, you see how oil is going to be used at a constant rate over the next 20 to 30 years. The same number of millions of tons of oil every year. The value will fluctuate, but the tons will be more less stable. Uh, uh, gas use will increase dramatically, uh, coal will increase some, uh, they all will peak in another 20 years or so. The reason why they peak is the yellow line. This is because gradually and very slowly sun and wind and biomass is entering the picture, basically squeezing out the fossil fuels. Uh, the fossil fuels uh, are not running out. Uh, the total use of fossil fuels over the next 40 years will be one half of what is already booked in the books of the energy companies of the world. So one half of what is booked in the balance sheets of those companies is air. It's, these are, this is coal, oil and gas that will not be used over the next 40 years. So when you want to place your money, you should certainly, and in the energy sector, you should find not those companies that have huge reserves, but those that have cheap reserves. Because, of course, it will be the cheap reserves that are produced over the next 40 years, not the expensive stuff that we Norwegians are spending you know, 150 billion Norwegian kroner a year exploring in the Arctic, which is, of course, totally asinine. You know, I'm a proud Norwegian, but you know, our oil sector is really pursuing stupid activity. Uh, good. So this is uh, the oil use. Once, I, once you know what energy is used, you of course know the main component of CO2 emissions. And uh, here it is. So my f the, 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 inter the global negotiators are trying to shoot for a 50 to 80 percent reduction in climate gas emissions by 2050 in order to keep the world under plus two degrees centigrade of warming. My forecast is, is that we will cut zero. You know, the only difference, so we will be emitting as much per year in 2050 as we do now. The only difference is that now emissions are growing at 3% a year. In 2050, they will be declining at 3% a year. They will not be declining because the negotiators, the 192 people that try to agree on 
something, that they have reached agreement, it will be declining because the GDP is declining, because energy efficiency is increasing systematically, and because the very slow move into renewables, you know, is happening. Once I know what is the emissions over the next 40 years, it's quick to calculate how warm it is going to be. This is, of course, what all the big computers uh, models do. And so the red line shows that we will move from current situation, which is plus 0.7 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial times, to plus 2 degrees uh, over pre-industrial times in 2050, and moving upwards. And so if you peak further out to the right, uh, in my view, the world warming is going to stop at plus 3 degrees uh, centigrade uh, later in the century. What does plus 2 degrees centigrade in 2050 mean? It means, uh, and here I have to keep to the manuscript, in order to not be accused for being imprecise, which is of course what climate, uh, what's that called, deniers uh, always do. So, more floods, more droughts, stronger cyclones and hurricanes, more forest fires, Pacific Islands will disappear, Bangladesh will move, Bangladeshis will move inland, and India, by the way, has started to build a fence, you know, to keep the Bangladeshi out. Uh, the US is building dikes to keep water out of Manhattan subway, and farmers will not know when to seed, and the birds will not know when to fly. That's essentially the situation. So it's a, an endless sequence of extreme weather events, you know, which come sporadic, not systematic, and is going to be incredibly bothersome. Then I want to just make one quick note on food. There are, of course, umpteen sectors in this analysis, so if you're interested in something else, read the book. But let me give you the, the, the food story. Since I know exactly how many people there will be over the next 40 years and I know how rich they are, I know, of course, how much food they're going to ask for. And then comes the question, can the world produce this food in a sustainable manner? And the answer is yes. The world can easily produce three times as much food as it does today in a sustainable way. We will only need 70% more food by 2050 than we do uh, now. Then you may say, but how, why is there starvation? And then I hope to teach you one thing. There is starvation in the world, not because the world cannot produce much more food. It is starvation in the world because the poor people cannot afford to buy the food, or to be even more simplistic so that you get the point. The point is that the African who is starving does not have enough money to pay the Ukrainian farmer, you know, to take the excess black soil territories in former Soviet Union, put it under the plow, produce food, and then give it to the, the, the African. So the reason why we have starvation has nothing to do with physical constraints. It has to do with income distribution. That was the case in 1970 when I started this work, when there were starving people. There are starving people now. They are starving not because of physical constraints, but because of income distribution. And this will be the case in 2052. And actually, there will be as many starving people in 2052 when you do the numbers as there is today. Good. So then you have learned something about food. Now comes the discussion. And now we are going into much more entertaining territory. And I will try to smile. So what have you learned? First of all, you have learned that the growth in the world population and GDP will slow by itself. It's not like those scenarios in limits to growth where you ran into physical constraints. The, the, uh, the population growth will slow because women will choose to have fewer children. Of course, it will be helped by the fact that there is more health, more education of young women, more contraception, perhaps, hopefully, a weaker church. You know, so there are these things that will aid the development, but the women will decide and solve the problem. Economic growth, the politicians 
the business people and the macroeconomists of the Western world will not succeed in you know, increasing productivity growth and they will not succeed in convincing the women to increase the population. And as a consequence, the GDP will stagnate in the EU and the United States over the next 40 years. So both of these are man-made decisions. They're not imposed decisions by physical constraints. That's the first thing you have learned. The second thing uh, you learn, there will be increasingly extreme weather. I've already gone through all the things. And then it says, and possibly a climate crisis. Sadly, I must truthfully and in a scientific manner report to you that there will not be a climate crisis before 2050, which is strong enough to be helpful, namely strong enough to kick democratic voters into accepting to pay more today in order to get a better future for their children. We will only get this endless sequence of very inconvenient but not totally catastrophic events. Until we get to 2080, then the temperature will be at plus 3 degrees centigrade and science does not know whether this will melt the tundra or not. If it melts the tundra in a self-reinforcing manner, we will get such additions of CO2 and methane to the uh, atmosphere that we could get a temperature that actually then takes off. If we're lucky, you know, it doesn't melt the tundra, and then we only have plus three degrees and uh, uh, the problems. Three, and this is interesting because there are probably many resource uh, skeptics in this uh, audience. There will be enough resources. I've just shown you how there will be more than enough coal, oil and gas. I've shown you how there will be more than enough food for those that can buy. And if you go through the whole rest, you will see that there will be enough resources of all kinds. For instance, the lithium for the electric batteries, for the electric cars that we're all going to run. Why? So go back to your pet resource report and have a look at the demand side. You know, most of these things look at the supply of resource X but they also have a supply uh, at demand side. And typically, all of these reports assume that there will be 10 billion middle-class people in 2050, because this is what uh, the UN forecast says, and this is, of course, the dream of all development economists, that we finally will get into a middle-class world. The point is that we will not so the demand will not be that of 10 billion people. The demand will be actually roughly one half of this middle class people in 2050. So the demand side is one half of what most people think. So if you reduce the demand side in most of these reports by 50%, you see that there are no resource constraints, which is very helpful because it lengthens the period through which resource efficiency, research and implementation can take place. And most likely this slowing of the population and the slowing of the economic growth over the next 40 years is actually going to be the fundamental solution of the whole resource crisis because we get more time to adapt to the limitations of the planet. And finally, don't kid yourself, there is going to be much more poverty in the future than most people think. And this is not only that many poor countries are going to remain poor, it is also that the inequity in the rich world is going to further deepen so that we get more poor people also in the, in the, in the uh, poor in the rich world, although, as I'll return to, I think that that's where we will get useful rebellions inside the market democracies, which force a transfer of income and wealth, you know, from the rich to the poor, at least in, in Europe and some, the civilized part of, of the rich world. Next question. How can that arrogant bastard from Norway, typical male chauvinist pig, you know, be so sure that he is right? And I ask this question because I don't like you to ask me that question. And all of you know. And the answer is very simple. I am sure that this will happen because this is the cheapest solution. 
This is what will result if anyone pursues short-term profit maximization, then short-term national interest, you know, the, the, etc. So if everyone continues to behave the way they normally do, you know, at the individual, at the corporate, at the national and at the global level, this is what you're going to get. And since I don't think there is a chance in hell that you know, humanity is going to become more long-term by itself over the next 30 years, I am sure that my forecast is correct. So that's the simple answer. Some optimists believe in the market, in the capitalist system. They think that capitalism means the market is going to solve the problem. To them, I say, you are wrong. Capitalism is made in order to allocate capital to the most profitable project. This is what the whole thing is all about. It is to find out where capital can be used most effectively. That's where the profits are the highest. This is where capital goes. This is exactly what we don't need at this point in time. We now need to allocate capital to sell solar and windmills, in spite of the fact that these are twice as expensive and four times as expensive as a gas-fired utility. Capitalism is never going to do this in an unaided manner. So the real optimist turns to democracy, to the state, to the parliament, and says that, parliament, please align the business interest with the social interest. You know, it must be easy you know, to tax or add prices in such a way that the business interest is the same as the social societal interest. To them, I say, good luck. What we have tried for the last 20 years is to do the simplest of those modifications, namely the introduction of a price on climate gas emissions. 20 years. Tens of thousands of man years of negotiation effort has been put into this, and what have we, have, what have we got? We have got a, you know, a small trading system in Europe, which is capable of producing a, a carbon price of you know, is it four or five euros per ton at this point in time, when what we need in order to make even the most obvious simple thing profitable is 40 to 50 euros per ton of CO2. So we are in a situation where capitalism is not going to solve the problem, and the parliament, we, democracy, is not going to make the decisions that are necessary in order to align the business interest. And let me give you another example in case you still hope for Parliament. Uh, if, or, and, and this happens every now and then, there is a forward-looking politician, an Al Gore, you know, who says that we have a problem and we should solve this problem and here is the solution. And then people quickly discover that that solution either implies higher taxes or higher price of gasoline, or higher price of power, and that politician is out you know, of that parliament within the election period. I will now proceed with my happy description of the future, and I'll make the obvious point that this far I've talked about global averages. Let me now go down at a regional level on one slide, just in order to show that all those of you who believe that the world is flat, that things, globalization is going to make things similar throughout the world, that you are also wrong. I'm picking enemies here as quickly as I can. By insulting as many people as possible, you know, the anger level increases. And I like this. Because possibly someone would start kicking, not my ass, but the ass of the decision, the voter, you know, those that actually keep us short term. So this is the after tax income of the average individual in the various regions that I use. So the top one is the United States of America. So the after tax income in the United States of America is the highest in the world because they are the most productive economy in the world. This is the real mature, the mother of all mothers. Uh, over the last 40 years, average income in the United States has done very well, doubled. Of course, it's a parenthesis uh, that 
me and other elite people that have been educated at the great American institutions in the 60s and the 70s, we have taken all of this growth. I mean, the poor blue-collar worker in the United States has exactly the same real purchasing power today as he had in the late 1970s. Detroit hasn't gotten a raise, you know, in 30 years. But that's an aside. The average looks good. This is, of course, me getting 10 times as rich and the, the other guy, you know, staying stable. What will happen over the next 40 years is that uh, the United States, the average income in the United States is going to go down. So be very flat for the next 20 years and then start to slide downwards. Why is this happening? Well, point one, they will be facing the problem with this soft, soggy nursing home type of sector before us. They, they are the most mature economy on the surface of the earth. They are the ones that have to pioneer you know, how do you get economic growth in a post-tertiary sector, in a quaternary sector, you know, where everyone does uh, things that cannot be robotized. The second thing is that the Americans owe a lot of money to the Chinese. Actually, they owe the Chinese one-third of a GDP. So one-third of the annual production of goods and services in the US is owed to the Chinese. And one day, you know, the Americans will have to restructure their economy in such a way that they produce something that the Chinese are interested in buying. And this will require structural change in the American economy. If you start looking at it, this cannot be done without huge income and wealth transfers from the elite to the masses in the United States. And that points to the third problem with the United States, namely Washington. So the US has a system of governance which is not even capable of ra making rapid decisions on simple matters. You know, and what they will have to do in the future is to make rapid decisions on complex issues that involve the income transfer, wealth transfer from the elite to the rest of the people. This they will not do, and as a consequence, the US, the peak US is over, you know, they are on their way out. The green line is Europe, it's us. Of course, Switzerland is an outlier from Europe and Norway is even more an outlier, but talk about the rest of the Europeans. They are, the Europe is in for a flat, another flat 30 years, we have been through flat 10 years, you know, with small cycles around the, the, the flat thing, this will continue. Why? It's slightly better than the US. Why? Because we're less productive than the US, so we can still learn some of the techniques that the Americans used in order to, you know, move the, between the green and the blue line. Luckily, we don't have the debt to the Chinese. You know, we are in a much better situation. And thirdly, although some of you may dislike Brussels, I'm a big fan of Brussels, Brussels actually make wise policy every now and then. I mean, there are decisions coming out of Brussels which actually make sense. You know, people don't like it, but they make sense from a long-term perspective. So, n Europe is going to do slightly better than the US, but uh, not very much. The winner is the red line. The red line is China. The average Chinese will be five times as rich in 2050 as the average Chinese is today. How is this possible? This is possible because of the perfect alignment of the interests of the Communist Party of China and the vast majority of Chinese. Most Chinese, this is a 2,000 year old culture, it's the most materialistic culture on the surface of the earth. Most Chinese are dead set on one thing, namely getting rich as fast as possible. The Communist Party could not agree more. They are also dead set on getting the average Chinese as rich as possible, as fast as possible, because that keeps them in power. Then some people who seem to be uninformed or haven't been enough in China over the last 30 years, as I have, you know, uh, they think that the 3% that of the Chinese who would rather speak their mind rather than getting rich as fast as possible. They don't think that the 97% who would like to get rich 
cannot handle the 3% who would like to speak their mind. You know, go to China, if you haven't been there, and talk to someone, and you see that the political legitimacy of the Communist Party of China exceeds by a factor of three, you know, the legitimacy of any chosen government that I know of, and I know of very many of the so-called humanitarian and, and the friendly and democratic and social democratic and communist, you know, uh, regions of the world. The red line will not be as smooth as it looks here. This will be a bumpy ride, but the general idea, they will solve the corruption problem, they will solve the pollution problem, they will solve the inequity problem. Why? Because, of course, the other rich countries did solve the things, you know, when they moved. And, of course, the Chinese are doing, as I said before, just the same as the elite in Japan did from 1950 to 1990, with steel control, you know, drove the system, you know, from an agricultural society to an industrial. And then the South Korean chairbos, the business leaders of, of, of South Korea, did exactly the same thing 10 years later. Now the Communist Party is doing exactly the same thing. Not much more than a piece of cake. The red, the burgundy line, the red wine line, these are the 14 uh, big. This is the Indonesia, the Vietnam, the, the Brazil, the, the India. I have very little to add because, of course, I have to be arrogant in order to be entertaining. And, and uh, here I can say very little except that I think that one half of them will succeed. And it looks for the time being that Vietnam is sufficiently centralized and sufficiently authoritarian that they may actually do the trick. Whether India will ever be among the winners, I strongly doubt, particularly having been there last week, you know, talking to the people. And they are focused, in my mind, on the wrong things. But that's, uh, that's the way it goes. The yellow line is the rest of the world. This is the poor world. Uh, these are the 140 countries that were at $1 a day in 1970 at $2 a day now, and they will be at $4 a day in 40 years in the future. We will have exactly the same development, I think, over the next 40 years as during the last 40 years. Why? Because there is nothing which is fundamentally different. You know, you have all the friendly Norwegian development aid, the Swiss development aid, the German development aid. We're swarming all over Africa, you know, trying to help. And, you know, the reviews have been done in my country, it probably has been done in your country, and we know that it doesn't work. You know, and uh, still we continue because, of course, we think one should continue. Uh, and that's what is going to happen. So, this is the story. And now I hope you are really depressed, because now we have gotten to what you must remember again. Most of you have a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or someone or a mother like I, you know, who ask, will ask tomorrow, what did he say? Okay, here is the answer. And I'll read this because this is important to remember. He said that the world population and economy will grow more slowly towards 2052 than most people expect, but still fast enough to trigger a climate crisis. Then he said, consumption will stagnate because society will have to spend ever more labor and capital on repair and adaptation to climate change. And then he said, the short-term nature of man, reflected in the short-term focus of democracy and capitalism, is the root cause of this development. That's the real fundamental problem. It's our genes. So, Say hello to your spouse. <laughs> no, we need to lift spirits. Because this is too sad. The first point which is important is that, of course, a much better future is possible. And this is perhaps for me the most frustrating point. It is technically possible uh, to solve the climate problem and it doesn't cost a lot. All we need to do in order to solve the climate problem, which is the most pressing problem, is to shift 2% of the labor force and 2% of the world capital investment from dirty sectors 
to clean sectors, that solves the problem. So you take the people who currently make fossil cars and you make them make electric cars. You take the person that currently build coal fire utilities and you force them to build solar the windmills and solar panels. You take the people that currently in my country dig down gas pipelines, you know, in order to distribute gas, you force them to hang up copper wire to distribute the energy from the so 2% is all what it takes to shift. This is the content of all the reports, the very serious and good reports that have been done on this issue over the last uh, uh, 20 years. Even simpler example, what you need to do, instead of building in my country big homes with thin walls, you need to build slightly smaller buildings with slightly thicker Swiss walls. I love your walls. I mean, you have real walls in this country. And, and this is the type of shift that needs to be done. And it only amounts to 2% of the labor force and 2% of the capital. If you think about it in growth terms, if there is 2% a year growth in economy, this is the same as postponing consumption developments by 12 months. So if Norway decided to do this. We would be as rich in January 2025 as we will now be in January 2024. The important point, this is simple. Still, it is not being done. Of course, this we know. And why is it not being done? Because, of course, it is slightly more expensive to do this. In other words, it's cheaper to do nothing, and consequently, we do nothing. And then I'll end by telling you what would have happened or what should happen, you know, what ought to be done. So what would be done if you chose me as your leader? <laughs> I, my program has six points. The first thing, the real solution is to further accelerate the slowing down of population growth. Further reduce the number of children per woman, and particularly in the rich world. I have a 30-year-old daughter. I have to pay her one dollar each time I say this. She is the most dangerous animal on the surface of the earth. Her consumption level is of the order of 30 times that of the similarly aged uh, Indian girl. I mean, this is not girl, this is an Indian woman. But, but the, the, the point still is taken. So it's population control in the rich world, which is important. Point number one. Point number two. What we need to do is to cut CO2 emissions. First, in the rich world, again. I mean, what the poor people do does not matter. It's what the one billion rich people actually do that matters. And this means ban the use of coal, oil and gas. That's where most of the CO2 comes from. So we basically say we ban the use of these things from 2022 or 20, I'll give you 10 years, 2024. Uh, of course, we already know the technologies. It's easy enough to do this. Why does it not happen? Because it is, of course, more expensive than continuing to use the coal, oil and gas. Three, some people are concerned about the poor world. What should we do with the poor world? We should shift all the development aid from all the good humanitarian causes that we are currently involved in and institution building and the whole thing. We should actually build a low carbon energy system for the people. Build the windmills, build the solar panels, build the hydroelectric dam, build the biomass you know, uh, heating uh, type of equipment. Most of the standard of living increase over the last hundred years, you know, is a result of energy use. It's not the result of institution. It's not the result of all these weird things that development people are very focused on. It is actually the fact that I have at my hand, you know, I use, God, it's embarrassing, like 20 kilowatt hours, you know, absolutely all the time, which is 20 horsepower, keeps me, you know, doing what I'm doing. So that's why I'm rich. It's not because of money. Four, we also need to reduce the ecological footprint. You know, there are other negative impacts of human activity than climate, uh, CO2 emissions. 
And this is the only way I have ever found how to reduce consumption or how to reduce the ecological footprint of you and I is actually to reduce production. In other words, to increase leisure. So you shorten the work year. We stop working. We introduce more vacation. Then we don't get the time to do so much production and the footprint gets smaller than it would otherwise be. And this one has the great advantage that here I think as a rhetorical speaker, I would be able to convince stupid democracy to pass this legislation. Because here you could go out and say, I'm in favor of one more week of vacation next year. And they say, at a fixed salary, and I say, yes, fixed salary. So the salary will stay the same. And I think there is a fair chance that they wouldn't look through the long-term consequences of this and understand that this would lead to lower production in the very long run and lower consumption in the long run. And then I could repeat every year because, of course, the memory of the people is shorter than, you know, one quarter Olympics. So this is... Uh, Five, you also should, I think, try to do something with the short-term nature of the human being. And the only solution there is, of course, to implement uh, a global type of government that instructs Switzerland to cut its greenhouse gas emissions and Norway to do this, and etc., etc. I didn't say that I was going to be elected, and I certainly did not say that I think this will happen. I just list this so that you know what ought to have happened and what would be happening if you chose me as your leader. And then finally, the final point is, of course, of particular relevance. Since incomes are not going to grow in the Western world over the next 40 years anyway, this is, of course, a very opportune time to change the goal of mature society from further income growth to growth in well-being. You know, the softer aspects of life. At the deepest level, uh, at the deepest level, my program is all about trying to convince the rich world society to be willing to make a sacrifice today in order to gain an uncertain advantage for people 30 to 60 years into the future. This is what it is all about, you know, to do something which is not necessary today in order to secure a slightly better world for people down the line. And that's what the, the common denominator in the program is all about. Uh, I know this will be hard, it is worth doing, and it is even from my point of view worth doing, even if it makes my forecast wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorgen, for this, uh, as usual, calm, quiet, uh, and uh, uh, politically correct uh, exposure. Um, we have time for a few questions, so please, if there is uh, uh, anybody who would like to ask questions, you can ask in French as well. We try to, yes, please, the gentleman there, if you can. Hi, uh, nice program for, for your election. Another question, I heard that you were in Dow Chemical and uh, my point or question is, could you explain your point of view in such a big uh, corporation and were you uh, aggressive and arrogant enough to explain your point of view? As you know, uh, 
a majority of the leading multinational corporations of the world chose 20 years ago to act on the sustainability bandwagon. It was called different things, social, corporate social responsibility, you know, which is the program that we're teaching here, uh, sustainability, uh, other things. Some of the real leading firms hired external counsels, you know, to help them do the right thing. And the Dow Chemical Company was one of the first ones that actually, you know, took in critical people from the outside in their midst and told them all about what they were doing, listening from, to advice from environmentalists, female rights people, uh, indigenous people, humanitarian people, the whole schmear. Uh, what has been the long-term effect of this? It has moved those firms over 20 years to do all those things that don't cost money. So, of course, this wild idea from my country that 50% of all the persons in the board should be women, you know, etc., things like this, you know, is gradually creeping in to best practice because it doesn't cost anything and women, of course, make as good decisions as men. So this is just tradition, you know, that keeps them out, etc., etc. You can go through most of the things that, you know, the reporting thing, the GRI thing. Yes, most people know tell how much CO2 comes out of the chimneys, you know, etc., etc. So they have put in place measurement systems, which do cost more than zero, but is so cheap compared to the bottom line of the company that it doesn't really matter. And now. After 20 years, we have interestingly come to the point where what most sustainability councils, like the one I'm on, we're now starting to ask for things that cost money. And then, of course, we're up against the shareholders, and the shareholders don't want this. You know, they would much prefer to have dividends high than that you know, the company actually uses the money to shift its gear. Concretely, in the Dow Chemical Company, which is a plastic producer that uses gas as a raw material and gas as an energy source in order to make all the plastics, glad wrap, you know, all the stuff that you use in your kitchen or in your workshop. There, the dream would be, of course, to shift from fossil gas, you know, or, yeah, exactly, to uh, renewable gas. You know, which is totally due to biogas, as you probably call it. This is a shift which is totally feasible, but of course it is, for the time being, very much more expensive, and in the long term there are supply constraints. You know, it, it gets difficult to produce enough biogas you know, from the agricultural estate of the United States, so you need to, to start doing things. We have been fighting for this for the last 10 years, and this one we don't win. Because that's, that's, then you're getting to the core of the multinational. And irrespective of the, you know, the, the great vision of the leaders of that company, it, in the end, it's the funds and the shareholders that own the company that would prefer to get a couple of billion dollars in dividends rather than you know, sh uh, uh, Dow doing this thing. So the only place where you can hope for things like this is in privately held companies where there is a visionary owner that actually can sacrifice you know, income over a 10-year period in order to carry the cost of the restructuring of the company into a sustainable thing. But uh, it has been incredibly helpful in my role as a science-based activist to have been on not only this council, but also the similar one in British Telecom for a long period of time, just in order to learn how things actually operate and, and where the situation is. Thank you, Jorge. Other questions? Yes, here. The lady over there. Uh, the gentleman. If you can that... give the mic her, is please. There... Hello, can you hear me? Oh, you have the microservice. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, Mr. Renders, uh, could you please comment on two extreme cases 
which you have shown in your geographical growth. One is Africa and the other one is China. Uh, Africa, according to UN, will be going from 1 billion to 2 billion by 2050. How will they manage this in terms of education, work, etc.? The second question is China, which is the glorious winner of this whole contest. So what you are saying is that you fully agree with their theory, which they put forward in the 1990s uh, or before, uh, with Hong Kong. One country, two systems. A political system, which is communism, and an economic system, which is capitalism. And that seems to work, according to you. Could you please comment? Uh, this is very simple. Africa is not going to make it. That's what I said. You know, Africa will still be poor 40 years into the future because, uh, because, the, uh, because nothing is significantly changed. The birth rates are coming down. Luckily, you know, the women of Africa are doing their job, except that they are not, the world average uh, fertility has come down from three and a half, uh, sorry, yes, three and a half, three and a half uh, children on average per woman in the world in 1970 to two and a half today and I believe the average will go down to one and a half in 2050 and that's the basis for my assumption. The Africans you know are still in the three and a half range and so they will be probably getting down to two and a half when we are in 2050 and you know and so on and they won't make it and so they will remain poor and they will remain less educated than you would have wanted to. The one good thing you can say about Africa is that infectious disease will be removed. You know, it's because modern medicine is so cheap that this we will actually spread, which has a huge help on the fertility rate because when children do not die when they're young, you know, the mothers and the fathers choose to have fewer babies. So there is some positive news but in general, I do not think that they will solve the problem. In China, I'm not sure I got the gist of your question, but what I think will happen with the system of governance in China is the following. Currently, the Communist Party has you know, 85 million members. So there is you know, you can basically say that the ruling party has 6% of the, 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 the populations as members. I think what will happen over the next 40 years is that that percentage will increase. That gradually, you know, you will have more hands on the wheel, so to speak, you know, by having perhaps 30% of the population as members of the, of the Communist Party, so that you broaden the democratic base. And the second thing I think will happen is that the Chinese leadership, which is of course, if you don't know this, highly educated, well informed, they understand these problems much, much, much better than the humanitarian organizations of the West or the environmental organizations or the anti-corruption police of, of, of the United States. These guys understand that the, the only thing that matters is control over, say, one half of the investment budget of a nation. You know, so they're going to leave to private business to do absolutely everything except the one thing that which is important, namely to build the country. So they will keep control, say, with 10% of the GDP and use it, you know, when they need transport from Beijing to Shanghai, they don't ask an advisor, is it profitable? What is the return on investment, etc.? They basically say, you know, we need transport. What are the options? The options are one, two, and three. Then they decide, let's build two of the three and just do the thing. And in this way, an intelligent group of people can very easily, in a 20-year period, build a nation. And that's what they're going to do. And so they will relinquish control with all these things that other people think is important, which is not important if you want to build a strong China, a good life for Chinese inside China. Because, of course, Chinese don't want to live in Switzerland, you know, or in Norway, or in the United States. I mean, China, this is a proud 
you know, old culture, they want to live in China. And so, of course, the task is to build heaven on earth for Chinese in China. And this they will do. It is okay. We need to give them. No, no, no. I think there was uh, over there one. <clears throat> Thank you for a very interesting and uh, entertaining presentation. Uh, I have a question about short termism. From your presentation, I get the impression that you are very, very many doubts about the ability of democracy to uh, adapt, to uh, overcome its inability to think in the long term. Uh, and in your conclusions, you even say that the only solution to overcoming short termism is supranational institutions. So I'd like to hear more about why is that the only solution? Uh, would the supranational institutions you have in mind be in any way indirectly democratic? Uh, and also beyond the role of the state and governments, uh, are there any other options to overcome uh, short-term thinking, for example, among businesses? I will try to be short. So, so uh, but this is of course a deep and very important question. Uh, luckily, democratic society has been able to impose on itself authoritarian rule in limited areas for limited times. The best example is, of course, the popular adoption of central banks. You know, we have amazingly and impressively, you know, been able to establish central banks at arm's length distance from the parliament so that technocrats determine how much money should be printed at the end of each month, not the parliament. So that's a good example of uh, what I call quasi-democracy, where you delegate to a group of allegedly you know, intelligent people you know, to, to do a job. You saw a second very interesting example of the same when Italy chose the Monte government uh, two years ago, three years ago, you know, in order to get Italy out of its normal chaos. And Monti was chosen, you know, he did a fantastic job for a year, and then he was ousted. Because, of course, some people didn't think this was a fantastic job, you know, and, and they were probably the ones that... And so that shows both the strength that you are capable in democratic, in pseudo-democratic society, able to allocate powers for a reasonable period of time. But it also showed the weakness, namely that the, the Italians then retired, took back you know, the authority, you know, even when the guy had been fairly successful in, in solving the, the big problems. We'll, we'll have a talk yeah. later about Italian politics, so I'll just try to give you some, some advice on that. Anyway, uh, any I, other... I, I, <laughs> when I launched my Italian version of the book, I got a standing ovation from all the women in the room. There was, because, I, because I said that it was, of course, and Italy has the lowest fertility of any country on the surface of the earth, yeah, except sure. China. And, of course, the reason is Berlusconi, who has created a society where it's totally impossible for a woman both to have a job and children. And, of course, since Italian women are wise, they choose not to have children. Okay. <laughs> Just another... Can you get uh, the mic over there, please? I think uh, she was asked, trying a few times to... She's coming? That's okay. That lady over there? Yeah. Um, I found your talk very depressing, which was your objective, uh, so I thank you for that. Um, but I found most depressing of all your list of uh, recommendations or things you would do if you were in power, because they, see so, they seem so incredibly timid compared to the scale of the problems that you described. And in particular, I was struck by the absence of any reference to China on your list of six um, <clears throat> plans of action, um, it seems that there are limits to your political incorrectness because even though you showed us the picture of GDP per region in the world, you never showed us the regional breakdown of CO2 emissions. But based on your projections for GDP for China, it must be that China is a very big part of what's contributing to the increase that you show. And my question is, surely all of your undoubted charm should be focused on trying to persuade Chinese elites 
who after all do not live in a democracy, as you've pointed out several times, who are highly educated, as you said, Surely all of the efforts, not just of you, but of anyone who cares about these issues, should be focused on persuading the Chinese to change how they do production. Be that to persuade them to do it voluntarily, or more likely to bribe them to do it, in order to reduce projected CO2 emissions over the next 50 years. <laughs> you must be out of your mind. Where do you find the ethical basis to point to a certain group of human beings on the earth and say that they should refrain from aspiring to something that another big group of human beings are doing? I mean, that's, if there is one loser in the attitudes of rich world people like you and I, it is this one which is, of course, permeating the global climate negotiations and is truthful, immoral activity in my mind. The per capita emissions of the Chinese is of the order of one-sixth of your uh, CO2 emissions. Yes, I agree that it would be helpful if they tried to develop in a way which